Hi, I'm Steve Carlson. I'm Al Franco's opponent in the U.S. Senate race, and I timely filed a contest against him for serious, material, and deliberate violation of Minnesota election law in that election. And that contest was pending December 19, 2014, before a Minnesota court panel of three judges, when Al Franken and Mark Ritchie went to Governor Mark Dayton and got him to illegally issue an election certificate to the Senate, the United States Senate, even before I knew about it, without my knowledge, based on a partial order, which was also without my knowledge. Although we had debated it, I was unaware of the order. And Minnesota law prohibits this. You simply can't issue a cert under those circumstances. And in fact, this is a violation of the Senate rules. This falsified certificate, neither the Secretary of State nor Franken dispute that it's falsified which was accompanied by an explanatory cover letter from Mark Dayton. Uh, and in that explanatory cover letter, he specifically claimed that uh, 240C.40 Minnesota statute had been followed. They were both forwarded uh, probably on the 19th of December before I knew about any of this going up to the United States Senate. And uh, this law prohibits uh, issuing a certificate when a contest is pending, and uh, Governor Dayton said it was followed. Uh, well, that is very clearly a false statement. And that's why you'll send, see me sending messages saying Al Franken has been lying to the Senate. So here is what I presented, a script that I read from. They wouldn't let me uh, record the proceedings. But here's the script that I read from in that courtroom with the Attorney General and Al Franken's campaign and counsel present. And this is from a hearing on a motion to avoid the procedure that resulted in Franken's election certificate being illegally issued while the material, serious, and deliberate violation of the election laws were unlawfully barred because of Franken's unlawful interference at the Minnesota State Courts. So here it is. It does not include some interesting discussion during the hearing. The proceedings to date, well, first of all, I stand by all of my submissions and the testimony in these proceedings. And the proceedings and the judgments to date, uh, which by law must be voided, have produced a twisted and Byzantine edict by two state courts, full of partial steps and orders and also produced an unlawful and void election certificate signed and sealed by Mark Dayton and countersigned by Mark Ritchie, uh, alleging, purporting to say that all was in order and Franken was duly elected. Uh, in our last meeting here, December 18th, and this hearing was on uh, March uh, 23rd, actually, Franken and Ritchie said you, the panel, could and should issue a partial preliminary order, just saying he's entitled to the certificate for having the highest vote total, but reserving issues about the validity of the election. But under our laws, which Franken urges we need not follow, those first two sentences of 20912, the contest provision, which address only the vote count, cannot authorize the issuance of the certificate by the governor because the, the contest was still pending. That's 204C.40 uh, subdivision 2. So the election results were still not final, still not official. In Article 1, Section 4 of the United States Constitution fully authorizes the Minnesota legislature to enact and complete congressional, uh, enact a complete uh, congressional election code. And so to violate those provisions in that code violates the U.S. Constitution. And there's a prominent case which originated in Minnesota from a conflict between our legislature and our governor in 1932 called Smiley versus Home. And in it, Chief Justice Hughes carefully enumerates the powers of the legislature under the Constitution, Article 1, Section 4. And so to begin with, Franken's claim that any legislative dispute over an election cannot be reviewed because of the holdings of Nixon, that's uh, Walter Nixon versus the United States in a case submitted by the Franken attorneys. Uh, such an argument must fail because 
The Ar Constitution, Article 1, Section 4, grants broad authority to the state legislature, and not uh, the governor or secretary of state, certainly not to Al Franken as a member of the 2008 Senate. Because although Congress may regulate these state election codes, it may do so uh, only by passing laws. So I said you could not lawfully issue that certificate. Franken used this pen, giving you just enough power to get that piece of paper, totally non-binding, which he could take to Washington and present it as required by the Secretary of the Senate in her October 1st, 2014 letter to Mark Ritchie. But this issuance was barred by law, 204C.40 subdivision 2, which prohibits the issuance of an election certificate when a contest is pending. And a contest was pending on December 19th, 2014, after you issued your partial order, which no one can argue finally determined the election contest I filed here. And yet Mark Dayton not only issued the certificate illegally, but he signed and sealed a letter which accompanied it with a cover letter which bore false witness to the U.S. Senate that 204C.40 had been complied with when he knew it had not. And when Al was sworn in, affirming that he would for sure uphold the laws and constitution, he knew he was violating that state law. And not only that, but violating congressional statutes, Senate requirements, as expressed in that October 1st letter in Article 1, Section 5 and 4 of the U.S. Constitution. You needed to gather the evidence, together with the findings about the count, which was not challenged, and forward it all to the U.S. Senate in order to comply with 20912, the contest statute. And I explained that this Minnesota law, which is quite good, by the way, was designed under Section 4 to comply with the proceedings of the U.S. Senate under Section 5 of Article 1. And you did not comply with this state law. Now Al's argument is that it's all water under the bridge, sound and fury signifying nothing, because the Senate relied on that unlawful and false certificate and cover letter to swear him in January 6th. He apparently didn't get the email, or rather the letter, that Mark Ritchie got. And apparently Mark Ritchie did not adequately peruse that letter. And here is uh, the item I'm talking about. This is, this is the answer of Mark Ritchie to my contest, and he leads it off with his letter from the United States Senate. This is the Secretary of the Senate, and she attaches portions of the Senate rules that require that, they require that he truly have been elected under Minnesota law, including the final uh, disposition and determination of any contests, just as if Norm Coleman was running. Uh, they wouldn't want Norm Coleman to rush off with an election certificate to Washington while Al Franken was still looking for those boxes that they found out over in Minneapolis so that he could edge ahead of, uh, of Coleman. And so I'm saying he must not have got uh, the letter, and apparently Richie didn't read it. And I have the letter right here. It's Exhibit A of Richie's initial response to the contest. An answer, I believe. And it reads, when the result of an election, this is reading for the United States Senate. This is not just trying to uh, ignore the Senate procedures, but to follow them. When the result of an election for U.S. Senator has been officially ascertained, and as I said, it had not, even though Dayton's cover letter suggested it had, federal law uh, 2 U.S.C. 1 A to B requires that a certificate of election must be signed by the governor attested to by the Secretary of the State, have the seal of the state affixed, and must be provided to the President of the Senate. Enclosed is a copy of Senate Rule 2, which I just showed you, which contains the wording for the certificate. The language must be adhered to, or the certificate will be rejected and returned to the state for recertification. Your Honors, it is incumbent on you and Senator Franken and Dayton and Ritchie and all the rest to inform the Senate that first, the result had not been officially ascertained. 
and that a contest was pending, and that therefore the certificate was unlawfully issued. It is germane, because the Senate in its letter required it, and apparently it's in the law she cited. In a Senate proceeding in which the senators are the judges, this clarification from the Senate itself has the force of law. I'm talking about this letter has the force of law. It's been violated. It has to be first officially ascertained, and as I said, the results were not final and official under Minnesota law. And it wasn't. And if the Senate knows this, according to the rules, the certificate has to be returned to the state for recertification. And they can't do this if you continue to withhold the record of this contest, including the evidence from them. And so Minnesota's complete congressional election code requires that you void that preliminary order, that you inform the governor directly that the results are not yet official, and then complete your proceedings. Yes, the Senate has the sole authority to judge, consistent with Article I, Section 4, which gives this power to the states, which I'm going to explain. Uh, the issue of, uh, they have the sole authority to uh, judge the issue of seating or exclusion of Franken. But the Senate has spoken. The action is pursuant to these rules set out by the Senate, which provide for recertification when there is an irregularity in the issuance of the election certificate. Both the form and the substance are irregular, or cannot be irregular, because what is required is the language, which has both form and substance. The, the language, which is also attached as Exhibit A, the next page, which I've shown you, says Franken was duly chosen by the qualified electors and that it is witnessed by the Excellency Governor Mark Dayton, who has affixed his seal. Well, I've read over all the cases of Franken, and given our excellent state law, which provides in the election that a contest including things like the protection of the voters, that is to say the constitutional requirements, and contesting validity for fraud and corrupt practices, the main issues he raises, why the proceedings and judgment finalizing the partial order of December 19th should not be avoided, is that pursuant to Senate prerogatives and proceedings, the Senate has acted and it cannot be undone. First, this does not really contest the voidness of that order. It should be void uh, because it was perceived and used as authorizing the issuance of the election certificate without any of the required evidence and record of the proceedings to the Senate. That is to say, uh, as if you were suspending subdivision two of 204C.40, barring them from allowing the issuance of uh, an election certificate while this contest is pending, which you, the panel, have no power to do. The preliminary order is nugatory if they did not have appropriate sanctions in the, uh, well, actually that's a, that's a jump uh, to page four, I'm sorry. The, uh, preliminary order is outside your powers. I know there was an issue why you could not do nothing but forward all this, why you could not in some way judge the contest and depart from the procedures set out in the legislators, legislature's election code 209-12. Uh, and I want to go right to this and out of all the cases Franken submitted. And at that point I said to Judge uh, Maslow, I said, very clearly, I asked you, because there had been a question from Judge Vandenorth whether or not uh, some uh, conditions precedent, some steps needed to be taken before they released all this other information to this uh, Senate. None of it would make sense because it would just totally uh, delay it. Uh, but, I, but Meslow asked right at the hearing, you're not saying that all we can do is gather up and certify all this evidence and send it to the U.S. Senate, are you? And I says, that's exactly what I'm saying because the law requires it. And that is what I want you to do. So they, it's pretty hard to say that I had not asked them, this was one of the conditions, that I had not asked the court to forward it uh, to them. Uh, in fact, I asked that right in the notice. So, uh, 
so there was this question that came up. Now, I, I want to focus on these Franken cases, on the Nixon case. Nixon is a federal judge who was impeached. So this is not an election by the Senate. Uh, it questions the impeachment clause in the Constitution, but yet it's being used by Franken as if uh, uh, no courts can act, only the Senate. Uh, and he challenged the conviction, Judge uh, Walter Nixon challenged his conviction by the Senate because he said it violated his due process for the House, uh, U.S. House of Representatives to do the fact-finding and at that point excluding the Senate and then the Senate convicts. Uh, but the Supreme Court said two things about their decision. First he said this was a clear grant of authority to the Senate and that's why uh, he could be Con, uh, convicted in, in this way. Now, here nobody's been convicted. What's happening here is the Senate is deciding whether to exclude or whether to seat Al Franken on January 6th uh, based on this false election certificate. And my point here is, to the panel is trying to say, well, uh, the state has a role under Article 4. It's not just Article 5 as Franken now says. Uh, and so they said, in the case of the impeachment clause, this, this authority to convict based on fact-finding by the House was a clear grant of authority to the Senate. And uh, secondly, uh, the court, Supreme Court, focused on the intention of the framers of the Constitution and what they intended by the term trial. Was it the typical civil procedure with court rules? And the court said the precise nature of the trial in the impeachment clause suggested, quote, that the framers did not intend to impose in additional limitations on the form of the Senate proceedings, unquote, and said the clause's first sentence uh, must instead be read as a grant of authority to the Senate to determine whether an individual should be acquitted or convicted, unquote. And so the question is, what did the framers intend with articles, uh, Article 1, Sections 4 and 5 as to how this decision of seating Franken should be taken. And so this explains first why your role, the panels, should be strictly prescribed by the state selection code. This is not a state matter, it's a federal matter. So there is a grant to the, uh, there is a grant to the Senate, but there's also a grant of authority, as I'm going to point out, to the state. And that also needs to be respected. And so the judges have to withdraw out of the way of both the Senate and the state election code and stick to uh, basically their place in, in that uh, congressional code. So first of all, because it's not a state matter, it's a federal matter, your role as a panel should be strictly prescribed by the state's election code. And it's a federal matter. Sorry, it's a federal matter like federal redistricting in the state legislature. It excludes the governor, excludes the secretary of state, because the legislature is not acting as a, in a legislative capacity, but as an agent of the people in a federal matter. The people as citizens of the federal sovereign, where the framers define the federalist system by assigning certain roles to the state legislature. So let's look at this case, Smiley versus Holmes because it makes this perfectly clear. First, as cited in Franken's case on the system used by Democrats in Texas to get away with significant voting regularities against Ron Paul in 1977, Justice Hughes explains the purpose of the constitutional provision as establishing a complete congressional code. And he gets all, all of those from this concise language of time, place, and manner. Article 1, Section 4 of the Constitution of the United States provides, the times, places, and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof. But the Congress may at any time, by law, make or alter such regulations except as to the places of choosing senators." Unquote. And Hughes writes, it cannot be doubted that these comprehensive words embrace authority provide a complete code for congressional elections, not only as to times and places, but in relation to notices, registration, supervision of voting, protection of voters, 
the constitutional protections, prevention of fraud and corrupt practices, counting of votes, duties of inspectors and canvassers, and making of publication of election returns. Not just making and public, publicizing election returns. It's going to be included in this code. In short, he sums up, to enact the numerous requirements as to procedure and safeguards, that's enforcement through the courts, which experience shows are necessary in order to enforce the fundamental right involved. And these requirements would be nugatory, there's nugatory, if they did not have appropriate sanctions in the definition of offenses and punishments. All this is comprised in the subject of times, places, and manner of holding elections. It involves lawmaking and its essential features and most important aspect. So still Justice Hughes. The legislature in districting the state is not strictly in the discharge of legislative duties as a lawmaking body acting in its sovereign capacity, but is acting as representative of the people of the state under the power granted, there's a grant of authority by said Article 1, Section 4. It merely gives expression as to district lines in aid of the election of certain federal officials prescribing one of the essential details served, serving primarily the federal government, and secondly, the people of the state of Minnesota. The leg and so the governor couldn't veto what the legislature came up with. The legislature is designated as a mere agency to discharge that particular duty. The governor's veto has no relation to such matters. That power pertains under the state constitution Minnesota exclusively to state affairs and so the judges cannot step in as if they're judging state affairs they're judging a Minnesota election for Congress. The word legislature has reference to the well-recognized branch of the state government created by the state as one of its three branches for a specific purpose and when the framers of the federal constitution employ this term we believe they made use of it in the ordinary sense with reference to the official body invested with the function of making laws, the legislative body of the state, and that they did not intend to include the state's chief executive as a part thereof. We would not be justified in construing the term as being used in its enlarged sense as meaning the state or as meaning the lawmaking power of the state. So it's the agency of these people for the people called on by the framers. This isn't even Congress. This is like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison and the rest centuries ago. That has to be honored in order for us to have a democratic republic in Washington. Now, then I quoted just a little bit more uh, from why in Texas, in that Ron Paul case submitted by Franken, why in Texas it was necessary for them to abide by this code. And this is from a Texas Supreme Court judge who says that when Ron Paul uh, ran for Congress and filed this contest, he did so with considerable support from a large contingent of the eligible voters of the 22nd Congressional District, and I'm talking about statewide Minnesota voters in this contest, who collectively appeared to have exerted themselves both physically and financially, although I didn't ask for any money, all in confident reliance upon an implied assurance from the state of Texas and here the state of Minnesota that the election to which they sought to dedicate themselves would be conducted in an honest, fair, and otherwise impartial manner, and in accordance with the law as codified by the Texas Election Code. And here I'm saying the Minnesota Complete Congressional Election Code, which assigns to the judges just certain roles, which they have to follow. There is now a concomitant duty on the part of the state, and I'm saying Supreme Court, saying the panel appointed by the Supreme Court, and by the way, to the uh, governor and the attorney general and the secretary of state. And that duty is to determine the integrity of that election process and thereby reassure all citizens 
including Respondent Paul, in this case me, and his supporters, that their confidence is well placed. And that duty is independent of anything that the Congress does or does not do. This is what this Texas judge says. And that's true. It came from the framers. And it's independent of anything they do in the U.S. Senate. Because this is a clear grant of authority under Article 4 to the state of Minnesota. All right, in this regard, an election contest is an end in itself, uh, which is accomplished when the results of the election and the right to the certificate of election, which our law clearly spells out, whether there's a question of the right to Franken's, or Franken's right to the certificate. Not, and this is why our laws hang up the issuing of it until the contest is finished, are declared by the district court. In this case, uh, that would be by, by this panel. So Congress cannot decide how this state, Minnesota, declares an election. Talking about the Senate cannot decide that or to whom the Minnesota certificate is to be delivered or when. These decisions are accomplished, not recommended or advised by the uh, Minnesota election contest proceeding. So that's what I presented to them so that people will follow this because this is not an issue that affects only Minnesota. It affects the entire nation. This kind of uh, gender quotas, race quotas, uh, sexual practices quotas, playing with the uh, with the emails that are collected by the Secretary of State. Some people get to use them, some people don't. Uh, the courts not enforcing the rules that are set up. They have a role in this contest provision, uh, and also the Supreme Court has a role in in the petition provision in that complete election code, which they didn't follow at all. And then they won't even judge when Al Franken comes in. And un, un, unlike in the, in the past, where one independence party candidate was excluded from one debate because of the tragic death of uh, uh, Paul Wellstone, but here the, Al Franken comes in and says, for the entire season of three debates, I'm just going to monkey around over here with Mike McFadden and pretend that that's democracy. And so what I'm saying on that is that that should have been adjudged under our complete election code. This cannot be decided by the FCC, Al's friends in Washington and his net neutrality crowd. This has to be decided according to the U.S. Constitution. And I'm going to stay with this issue until our Constitution is followed because it is the only way to free and fair elections and it's critical for the very existence, the Constitution and establishment of this country to survive. This is Steve Carlson and I approve this message.